Life. Every life. Every heartbeat. Began with a mom. Who willingly accepted a divine role? A thankless job? A sticky, sleepless, soul-stretching career? For nine months? 90 months? 90 years? She taught us right from wrong, left from right, baking soda from baking powder. She slept little and worried much. She laughed, lathered, rinsed, and repeated, and repeated. Who taught us to love God, to love others, to love ourselves? Who prayed with us and prayed for us? Who read to us and taught us what the words meant? It was mom. Who was the champion, the cheerleader, the chief inspiring officer? Who was the queen of bedtime, dinner time, holidays, holy days, early mornings, late nights, music lessons, life lessons, and everything we cling to with all our hearts? was, it is, and forever will be, Mom. Good day and thanks for joining us as we stop looking at God's faithfulness for just a moment and do a little self-examination of our own faithfulness. Let me start with a confession. I have been, uh, when the church doors are open, I'm there kind of Christian for almost my whole life. Almost. There was that one fourth year of university when I started to drift. I was thousands of miles away from my church and my family. I hadn't really connected that year with a church home after leaving my previous school where I had been very involved and very connected to the church. And my part-time job and my schoolwork was piling up, causing plenty of stress. We were surrounded by large churches of our faith. Lots of university kids came and went, and it was easy to just disappear. All the church elders and pastors probably thought I was at one of the other churches. When something like that happens, what can pull you back into the fold but the Holy Spirit and your own conscience? But what if that is what's happening right now? All around us, services are canceled at so many churches. There's no Bible classes and midweek gatherings or food festivities to keep us going. You might check in at online worship services, but if you don't, who's going to know? And when this pandemic is over, are all the little scattered sheep going to return to the flock? Or will we have gotten used to sleeping in on Sunday, fast forwarding through the songs or the sermons and ignoring God's commands to serve the world. Well, we talk a lot about the faithfulness of our Father in our times of worship, but today we really need to look at ourselves. Where is our faithfulness toward God and his church? Rick says, there are stark differences between building a church and a church building, but there are also some instructive similarities so today's theme is faithfulness and our role in completing the plans of Jesus for his church. As we'll see, we can only fulfill our responsibilities if we have vision instead of division. In fact, we need 2021 vision. So let's begin with a song that tells how our song to God draws us together.
to light Nothing can stop the sound God be lifted high The songs of the people will rise The songs of the people will rise Hear the broken See the helpless find the way Through the darkness To the light in Jesus' name
This next song is a sweet battle cry for us today. I urge you to pay close attention to the words that exhort us to get up off our comfy couches, go to war against evil, and re-enlist as part of the Lord's army. reading today reveals God has created a lot of building imagery in scripture, reminding us that we are part of the temple of God and that Jesus has provided the foundation. The words of Paul. We are God's workers. Because of God's grace to me, I have laid a foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. 
Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But Judgment Day will reveal what kind of work each builder has done and whether a person's work has any value. If the work stands, that builder will receive a reward. But if it does not, the builder will suffer great loss. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Wow! If the work stands, that builder will receive a reward. We need to look at our life service to the church. Will our work stand? Are we doing shoddy building, half-hearted quality assurance? Any work at all? We want to make it clear when we're talking about responsibility to the church, we're not talking about working your butt off into heaven. God's salvation is a free gift that can't be earned by your behavior. But there is a normal response to what God has given us, just as there would be if someone in your life gave you an undeserved, unusual, and completely over-the-top present. You would respond, not to get the present, but in gratitude for the gift. In an old hymn we used to sing, His banner over us is love, our sword the word of God, we tread the road the saints above with shouts of triumph, Todd. By faith, they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory, O oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Let's pray with Don. Dear Heavenly Father, all praise and glory belong to you. You are eternally reliable steadfast and unwavering because like love faithfulness is one of your inherent attributes your word teaches us that when you say that you will do something even to us if it seems impossible you do it and when you say that something will happen it happens your promises are true as it says in the book of kings not one word has failed of all the good promises he made Lord, as we strive to know you fully, help us to trust your promises regardless of our circumstances. Enable us to love and follow you wholeheartedly. Help us to recognize who we are, the Church of God, as Paul says, Christ's ambassadors who have been entrusted to share the good news of Jesus Christ our Savior with the community and with each other. May the Holy Spirit produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in our lives and in our church. Empower us to have soft hearts and hardened feet as you open our eyes to the needs of each other and the world around us. Teach us to be doers, not just hearers of your word, and enable us to bear one another's burdens. Thank you, Lord, that our future is secure, that we are your children, heirs and co-heirs with Christ created to be in a loving, trusting relationship with you. Father, bless our church here in Brantford and your faithful followers around the world. Bless our leaders, Susan and Rick, and enable us to be able to get together soon to worship you. We ask all of this, Heavenly Father, in the name, power, and authority that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The very nature of communion is supposed to involve a group of people together. So it's been especially hard to think about communion alone, communion at home, communion abandoned. This video that we're sharing today shows that idea isn't true. At home or in a packed church building, there is great power in communion. Get your bread or crackers, your wine or juice ready to participate. And first we're going to share a simple song that reminds us when it comes to being faithful, God always goes first. He demonstrates true faithfulness to us time after time after time, even in the face of our own unfaithfulness. Oh, 
This blessing today comes right from Christ himself, telling us to build on what is strong, trustworthy, and faithful, our God. Jesus said, I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is well built. Good advice for us this week to build on the foundation of God. And now here's Rick with his visual sermon on vision versus division. Have a great week. In Rome and other cities, this is what some of the first Christian meeting places looked like. After the crucifixion, followers of Jesus were persecuted, so they went underground, literally. They buried their loved ones in subterranean crypts called catacombs and worshiped there, hiding and celebrating the risen one in the presence of the dead. In the early days, believers felt no need for church buildings because they expected the end of the world at any time, with a full resurrection of the dead led by Jesus the light of the world. But in later centuries, great stone cathedrals stabbed into the sky. After three centuries of persecution, that was only possible because the Roman Emperor Constantine had a vision of Jesus and legalized Christianity. From then on, elaborate churches were built, modeled on the Dome Pantheon, where ancient Romans had worshiped their pagan gods. At the time, people lived in small homes of wood and mud, and they rarely saw pictures. So the new churches were deliberately massive and beautiful to honor the glory and grandeur of God. And they used paintings of Bible stories to educate the illiterate population and lead them to faith. It's a bit of a shame, but many of us were raised to believe that any cathedral was nothing more than Catholic waste and pretension. But if you still lean that way, I recommend you read your Old Testament, where God rewarded David and Solomon for building him this extravagant temple, which, by the way, was their idea, not his. Yes, I know, Jesus says the most important housing, the most important dwelling, is the heart. But when his disciples got on the case of a woman who anointed his feet with an expensive perfume that could have been sold for the poor, he tells them to leave her alone. Because any gift offered with the proper motive is honored and embraced by God. And today I want to talk about such a gift, this one offered by Antoni Gaudi. I want to use his story as a metaphor for our relationship with the church. Almost a century after his death, the Spaniard is known as God's architect. I found out why while standing dwarfed and dazzled amidst his masterpiece in Barcelona, Spain. The Church of the Holy Family. It's the most stunning human structure I've ever experienced. I've never felt such awe from anything made by human hands. Five generations have now watched the edifice take shape since 1882 when Gaudí took over, just a year after work began. The architect devoted his life to the project. From the start, Gaudí was unconventional. As the head of Barcelona's architecture school handed him his diploma, he said, we have given this either to a fool or a genius. Time will show. In the same way, Jesus was absolutely revolutionary. He was radical and unsettling, and people just didn't know what to do with him. But he devoted his entire life to building his church, work that would continue long after his death. 
Our architect forged a unique and bold connection between us and God. He lived his entire life only to bring glory to his Father and hope and salvation to the rest of us. One day, Jesus asked his disciples who people thought he was, and of course, nobody knew for sure. And then he made it much more personal with a question he asked each of us today. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Jesus said he would build his church on that confession, the bedrock assurance that he was God in human flesh, sent to save the world. That building is still underway, and we can learn some valuable lessons from Gaudí's experience. When Gaudí took over the fledgling project in 1883, he wanted to find bold and courageous ways to reflect God's love and power, seen in both nature and in scripture. He designed three facades, depicting the nativity, the crucifixion, and the glory of Christ, along with distinctive towering spires representing Jesus, the 12 disciples, and the four gospel writers. The tallest was to be topped by a cross at 172 and a half meters or 566 feet, enough to make the tallest church in the world, but slightly lower than the main hills surrounding Barcelona, because Gaudí didn't want his creation to be higher than God's. Now that's a powerful reminder for us. First of all, it's not our church, it belongs to him. We're simply continuing the work started by Jesus, building the church in our own generation to showcase the love and power of God. But the idea is to bring credit to him and not to ourselves. So in everything we do, we have to remember that God is supreme and never try to overshadow him with our paltry plans and achievements. Gaudí kept his balance and humility because he knew the work would far outlast him. Referring to God, he said, my client is not in a hurry. Serene in that knowledge, Gaudí was more concerned that his work draw people to faith, so he focused on the nativity facade, hoping its beauty and optimism would inspire people to carry on the mission and the message. But he also knew the heart of that message was the atoning sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus and the glory to follow, the very things that give us hope. Together, we in the church bear witness to that love not in an institution or organization, but in a natural, organic, and dynamic family. We are the holy family. After all, holy means set apart for the service of God, and that's our calling. Speaking to those who accept the forgiveness and lordship of Jesus, Paul says, God has reconciled you to himself through the sacrifice of Christ, so you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. A lifelong bachelor, after his love for a school teacher was spurned, Gaudí poured himself into building his church, often fasting so vigorously it almost killed him. As an older man, the celebrated architect chose to live on donations in a small house next to the cathedral. He dressed in threadbare suits and was so unconcerned about his appearance, he was often taken for a beggar, and that contributed to his death. On June 7, 1926, Gaudí was walking to church for daily prayer when he was hit by a tram. He was dressed in a shabby suit and had no papers, so no one gave him much attention. Though eventually taken to hospital, he got only nominal care, and then when finally recognized the next day, the architect was too far gone to benefit from even the best treatment. He died at 73, was given a massive funeral, then buried in the Sagrada Familia crypt. Many thought it spelled the end of the architect's glorious vision. That's exactly what many people thought when Jesus died. Even today, there are lots of people who don't recognize him or care about his death and resurrection because Jesus does not match the savior they're looking for. They want somebody much more concerned about this life, whereas God is infinitely more concerned about spirituality, reconciliation, and eternity. 
That is not a popular message in this on-demand age, but there are many still faithfully committed, so progress continues, though not without barriers. At the time of Gaudí's death, the church was less than a quarter complete. Then, during the Spanish Civil War in 1936, rebels set fire to the crypt and heavily damaged Gaudí's original drawings and plaster casts. Others argued it was essential to move forward, remaining faithful to Gaudí's vision and core values. So work is still underway to complete six remaining steeples and decorative details. Though completion is set for 2026, the 100th anniversary of Gaudí's death, most people recognize the work will never end. And so it is with our work as each generation carries it forward. Sin and cynicism have tried to destroy God's vision, but we persist, even though we know even our best efforts will never match our architect's master plan. Still, God honors our intentions and our effort. From the 1950s to the 70s, Gaudí's heirs focused on the passion facade. Then work continued on the spires and interior, and the glory facade was started in 2002. In 2011, an arsonist started a fire, but it was contained in 45 minutes before doing irreparable damage. Even today, some people are tired of the whole thing and say, enough already. The church is just fine the way it is. But committed workers refuse to give up. They've kept the vision, and this is how they foresee the end result. These days, skilled sculptors continue the artistic directions of yesteryear, but construction teams also use the latest technology, including sophisticated engineering software, 3D printers, and computerized machines that can cut stone to a precision early artisans could only dream of. Methods and means have changed, but the iconic architect's underlying message of God's love and power still shines through. In much the same way, there are people in every congregation who want to leave the church exactly the way it is, a tribute to the past and to tradition. But Jesus calls us to build his church with a view to the future. So we must preserve the very best of our history and yet use every modern means at our disposal to proclaim the forgiveness, the power, and the love found in Jesus. The spiritual transformation is mirrored by the physical one here, glacially slow sometimes, but gradual and meaningful nonetheless. In places, you can see how things have changed in ways that aren't always seamless. There are color differences, for example, because of weathering and the different shades of sandstone from different places. 
Where Gaudí's instructions were vague or missing, those who've come after him have had to use their best judgment, wrestle with various situations, and try to stay true to his original intent as much as possible. It's the same with us in our relationship with Jesus and his plan for the church. Would Gaudí and Jesus be happy with everything they see in today's church? Of course not. But I don't think there's any doubt their devotion to their creations would go far beyond any criticism. Our offerings are always going to be imperfect. God's love is not. Outside is a spectacle to behold, with elements that resemble everything from a towering sandcastle to an exquisite art gallery open to the elements. But the interior is breathtaking, with arches, vaults, and massive columns all designed by Gaudí to instill the same reverence he felt when standing in the middle of a tall forest. Light plays upon the walls with abandon. In the morning, a cool light is filtered through blues and greens, and by afternoon, it becomes a warm light burnished by reds and yellows. It's a wondrous reminder of the beauty that can happen when the light of God's love is reflected through the lives of his people. You are the light of the world, Jesus said, like a city on a hilltop that can't be hidden. No one lights a lamp and hides it. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand to give light to everyone. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so everyone will praise your Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father, not us. It's no wonder three million visitors a year come here to marvel at the engineering and often to meet God in a profound new way. With competing visions, theological civil war, attempts to burn down everything the church stands for, and the constant bickering of believers. And yet the beauty is unbounded. Yes, many remain divided over whether our architect is a genius, but have no fear. It's one thing to raise a building from the ground up, and quite another to raise a body from the ground up. When it comes to the truth, time will show. Time will show. So let's get out there and be the Holy Family.